you ever figure out what happens with the uh, one on six? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we know. That it, when it fired, it would have, um, it was a pyrotechnic valve. <clears throat> and, um, the gas bottle sits down, down here, the gas is under pressure at 5,000 to 6,000 psi depending on what it is. 6,000 psi for the nitrogen, 5,000 for the hydrogen. And in this particular case, these are both titanium, but in the one that flew it was aluminum for the hydrogen and tie six, four and a half for the nitrogen. But when the power valve fires, it actually is a solid piece of metal here, and there's a wedge driven by the pyrotechnic that substitutes a hole for the um, what was a previously blocked passage. And that allows it to keep this uh, pressure throughout the three or four months of spaceflight. Then the gas flows in this direction and enters a regulator. And from the regulator, whoops, the hell did it go? Oh yeah, it comes out of the regulator. This is an isolator, so. The Teflon here is just to keep it electrically uh, separate from the rest of this chassis. And that was because... I've forgotten why that was. Uh, there's little sensors in here. One a temperature sensor, there's a platinum wire temperature sensor over here. And this guy's a strain gauge, the little guy with the, the brown stuff. That's fine wires looped many times in a thin film and that makes the uh, strain gauge, so it changes length, it changes resistance, and that delta R becomes the strain. So how we knew that the spacecraft... That was, that was the pressure the pressure gauge for the eight Yeah. Well, actually, we could actually see it in real time. It was the temperature, I'm pretty sure, because we couldn't get both channels, right? We couldn't get pressure, which is the strain gauge, and temperature at the same time in real time. So we took the temperature only. And since there wasn't any temperature fall in the nitrogen bottle, we're pretty sure that what happened was that it, it jammed up with debris from here. And then what happens then is that if this gets blocked any place, it's 6,000 psi on this side, and it's um, whatever the hell the right pressure was, 100 psi or so on this side. But if it does jam, then this side will slowly, slowly go to 6,000 psi, to which it's never been exposed. And when that happens, you can start to begin to get a leak. And that leak would be what the spacecraft began to react to. So its sensors would have told them they were beginning to rotate, and then they would have... Was there a, ro was there a uh, attitude correction? Yeah. That's what they got pissed about. Because it kept correcting for attitude of something that went on for like 24 hours. And so they assumed that it was us. And, um, that's about the size of it. Because I haven't seen it in a long time. And I never thought I'd hold one again. <laughs> oh, geez, throw it away. Small world. Tell them about the signing, how you signed it. Oh, um, well, actually, the interesting part was that JPL was trying to figure out how it was to look sitting on the spacecraft platform. And so they whipped up something that looked kind of like this, the four points of attachment. And then when I got that drawing and I looked at it and thought, sounds good to me, and I just started from there, frankly. But this was all meant to be hogged out. And you can see, um, I don't know if, well, there's ball end mills used in here, but you have to hog things. And Harry Peterson's shop is the one that did all this. You do all that, and then uh, in those days there was no NC machining, miracle control machining, so all this had to be done by hand and by a, a guy, a machinist, following a print, and then doing his plunges, and then moving it along in X and Y all by hand. And so you have to take and accomplish this angle and everything. Um, the regulators we got from a company that did aerospace stuff, whose name escapes me now, but that was kind of neat. The straps were set up. Oh, look, a little, well, uh, a little rust in here, too. That's supposed to be 300 series stainless, and it's just surprising that it rusts. Usually, that'd be 400 series that does that kind of crap. But this allows it to go into expansion. There's 20 mils of Viton under here and everything. So. How you doing? <laughs> okay. I was happy to see the stop sign still going. Yeah, hmm. oh, good. Yes, yes. Oh, and I scratched my son's, my first son's name into this right here. Uh, subscribe. Yeah.
so that uh, his name's Kevin, and I wanted him to orbit the solar system forever. So he got a name scratched in there very lightly, so it'd get past JBL. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I heard that. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, we got it. We got it 80% south. Oh, and you already know this, but this is a titanium vessel that has been proof tested with hydrostatic water, taken up to whatever the hell this design pressure was, which was quite high, but not that high because the safety factor. Whenever you fly anything, uh, usually the safety factor is like 10% on flying hardware. Military hardware, five percent. On our hardware, I think it was around ten or fifteen percent. And then it's supposed to blow exactly when they calculate. And this pretty much did. This was a titanium vessel, and I think it burst at eight thousand psi or something like that. We had to switch from titanium to aluminum because titanium formed hydrides inside with hydrogen in contact with it, and when the hydrides form, then free hydrogen can begin to form inside the metal and blister it and destroy it by explosive badness. And now I'm going to go back to drinking wine, which is what I'm really good at. Really? I don't believe anybody remembers on this. I didn't say. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Laurel? Hi, how are you?